Welcome, everyone. I'm Chuck Cohen, Managing Director of Benco Dental, and I'm here today with a truly awesome individual with a very interesting story, Dr. Blake Warner. Dr. Warner is the Assistant Clinical Investigator for the Salivary Disorders Unit at the Epithelial and Salivary Gland Biology and Dysfunction at the NIH. I'm sure I somehow botched that title, but I am fascinated by dental researchers and Dr. Warner is going to tell us a little bit about how he got to be one of the few, in my experience, uh, really full-time or almost full-time dental researchers in America. He is a full-time dentist and researcher at the National Institutes of Health, the NIDCR, which is where most all of the dental research in America happens. So welcome, Dr. Blake Warner. Thank you for being with us today. Hey, thanks, Chuck. You can call me Blake. And uh, thank you for that warm introduction. Um, yes, yeah, so I, I am a, a basically a full-time uh, clinical and translational dental researcher at the National Institute of Dental and Craniofacial Research. And um, I sort of came this way uh, sort of circuitously, like many scientists do. You know, we, it wasn't originally my plan uh, to become a, a, a dentist scientist. Uh, I started out thinking I wanted to be a geneticist, and I didn't know what that meant. And I went to college, and I took genetics, and I loved it. But then I, something didn't click, and so I decided to do organic uh, chemistry research. That was my first real research experience, and that didn't click either. And there was something missing. And, um, and I had some other experiences, and I taught water fitness classes, and I learned that I really like to talk to the public. Uh, I like to engage with patients, maybe even. And that's when it got the gears rolling that I should consider uh, going to dental school because, uh, my dad's a dentist and, and I knew that, but like when I was a kid, I was, I always thought I'm not going to be a dentist. I don't want to do that. Um, and, uh, but then I, I became a research assistant myself and I studied cancer and I did molecular biology and, and tried to understand, um, the molecular basis of tumors. Um, but I was still, something was missing. I was always working alone. I was in the basement. I was working with my animals and I missed some sort of, there were the, the spark wasn't there. And so I decided to do a master's in public health. And that's where I started doing oral uh, biology and cancer chemo prevention, where I was trying to prevent oral cancer. And, uh, and that snowballed in a way into going to dental school and applying for a PhD and then being fully in dental school and fully in a PhD at the same time. And I was a little, I was a little wild. I, you know, I did both of those basically in a five-year period, P DDS, PhD. I hit it really hard. Um, I was lucky because my, uh, my girlfriend at the time, now my wife, was also in grad school at another university. And so I could devote basically 150% to, um, to uh, research. And when I, when I ended, I knew I wanted uh, a cl clinical specialty that would um, sort of uh, work well with um, my desire to do research. And for me, that was pathology. I could use the microscope. I could look at, I could look in the mouth of patients. I could do clinical pathology. And for me, that, that was the intersection. Oral pathology plus microscopes equals I can find new things. Okay. And so in the process of residency, I found that some of the patients who, who struggled the most were those patients who had dry mouth conditions, either from external beam radiation due to head and neck cancer or possibly autoimmune diseases like Sjogren's syndrome. And in, in doing a little research, I found a clinical trial at the National Institute of Dental and Cranial Facial Research, which was led by my now mentor, Jay Carini. And he was doing gene therapy to correct the saliva dysfunction, okay, or the salivary dysfunction or lack of saliva in the mouth due to external beam radiation. And by putting this small gene just in the salivary glands, he could correct the water movement or the salivation in pigs and mice and monkeys. And we were now doing it, we're gonna do it in humans. And so I got to actually do the gene therapy administration uh, into the parotid glands of, uh, of about uh, 12 patients at NIDCR. So first year I got there, Jay asked me, can you do this? I said, yes, I can, I can do this. I had done imaging in the salivary glands before and it's basically the same process. 
and, uh, and and away we went. So for me, you know, doing gene therapy and things that I thought were only possible in sci-fi movies, I was doing it on humans. And that then I was sold. I was like, this is going to be my career. And if I could run a lab and I could have a clinical research program and work in the clinic every day and basically do both, I was going to be a happy man. And, um, and that's what I've been pursuing ever since. That is very awesome. So Let's describe, first of all, the first research project you worked on about the gene therapy set for salivary disorders. First of all, for those who don't know, not being able to produce saliva is a horrible situation yeah. to be in. It's just a horrible side effect of some awful cancers. So being able to fix that is very, very important. Did you actually come up with a therapy that fixes that? Uh, we're not there yet. Uh, we're in a safety study and we're almost, we're almost done um, with that safety study, I can say that the animal models are very, very promising. Wow. And uh, not only are they very promising, but there is, they, they do seem to be relatively safe. And the beauty of this type of approach is that once you correct the, the deficit, it seems to be a treatment that will last for a very long time. And I want to say almost a lifetime potentially, because wow. um, it does last the life of the mice. And for the pigs, it lasts uh, for years. And so for humans, you know, we need to let that trial progress a couple more years and we can tell you how that works. Um, you know, but all in all, I, I'm, I'm very excited about it. I think it's going to be uh, a way that we treat many other conditions, not just salivary dysfunction, but if you could co-opt the salivary glands to do other things, possibly act like an endocrine organ. Now the, the sky is the limit in how you can um, sort of reprogram an already very functional gland to do just a little bit more and maybe correct a systemic disease uh, that may be, uh, you know, something uh, uh, like a hormone deficiency. Um, that's kind of where this, the promise of this type of, uh, of this type of therapy lies. And that's all like, that's all the research of my mentor, Jay Carini. And, uh, and for me, I wanted to create a clinical program of my own that, of my own that was very complementary to this already established clinical trial. And so like together, you know, we can uh, really address some unmet medical needs. Um, and that's kind of like my uh, interest is being able to integrate dentistry with medicine and sort of being on the front lines and saying, you know, dry mouth is a real problem. And, you know, this is a complication of either uh, radiation therapy or oncologic therapy or some sort of systemic autoimmune disease. And we need to pay attention to it. You know, medical insurance by and large doesn't reimburse patients if they lose their teeth. Uh, they don't reimburse for placing implants. Um, now, if you were to lose a limb, you know, in an accident or an infection, you could have a prosthesis made. But that's not true for dentistry. And I feel like there's a lot of room. There's a lot of distance to sort of improve that relationship between medicine and dentistry. You know, being able to salivate, being able to chew your food, having a high quality of life is, is uh, really, really important. So like my research might be a very small portion of that, but that's sort of how it, how I wanted to blossom into, you know, a greater, greater uh, acknowledgement of the role of the oral cavity in systemic health. That is totally cool. So of the projects you're working on today on a, from a research basis, what are the one or two that have you the most excited? So for, a, so I already told you about the, uh, the, the, uh, uh, radiation induced xerostomia. And um, the, the next project, and I, I'm going to end on like a capstone project that happened this pandemic specific. The next project is trying to better treat Sjogren's syndrome. Right now, there are no drugs to treat Sjogren's syndrome that are very effective. The ones that we do have are like hydroxychloroquine, which you heard about in the news about yes. possible COVID therapy. It wasn't proven to be very effective, but it's very effective at treating some of the systemic symptoms for Sjogren's syndrome. Um, it has no impact on patient's salivation. So the main clinical complaints of Sjogren's are dry eyes and dry mouth, and it has no, uh, no benefit for the, either of those organ systems. Um, dry eyes, it's treatable. You know, you hear, you hear of patients having Zydra or other drugs to treat their dry eyes. And they actually, I can show you uh, in my data, I have longitudinal data that the patients that go on some of those medications, their eye function gets better, but their, their oral function continues to decline. Um, and I think that's, uh, again, one of these unmet medical needs. We need therapies that target pathogenic inflammation in yeah. Sjogren's syndrome. And I think we have a drug that we could repurpose from other uh, indications. And we have a clinical trial starting where we're using the, um, the Pfizer or the drug tofacitinib 
um, which is marketed under Zelljans, and we're testing its safety in uh, patients with Sjogren's syndrome. So I'm very excited about that because we're going to look at the actual tissue with some really new technology called single cell RNA sequencing. Basically, we look at all the genes that are on and off in every single cell in a biopsy. And we do that before they get drugs and they get it after they get drugs. And we can see the individual cell types that respond to that medication in the target tissue of this autoimmune disease. And that's gonna be revolutionary. Being able to say, this is the cell that I thought would be respond. And in fact, it did respond and the patient has better saliva flow because of it. Um, you know, having that granular of, of detail is, is really critical. That's and the awesome. second story yep, is a uh, very pandemic specific. We in, you know, my wife is an epidemiologist and she works in critical care medicine at NIH and uh, she, so her background is infectious disease epidemiology. And when we started to get these reports from Wuhan, China, that there was an emerging uh, a severe um, acute respiratory syndrome type disease that likely was a coronavirus, um, you know, NIH mobilized, everyone mobilized. Anybody who could uh, do a coronavirus work from big data analysis all the way down to molecular biology, uh, we, were, we were doing it. And so she, she kind of said like, hey, Blake, this is going to be big. And I that night went, uh, actually, I talked to my mentor and he said, you know, it's possible viruses sometimes have uh, tropism where they can grow really well in salivary glands. And I said, yeah, I, you know, this, this, is, uh, this could be big. Let's look at our single cell RNA sequencing data that we already had. And sure enough, um, we saw the target, which is called ACE2. You hear about ACE2 on the news all the time. And a couple of the other proteases, very specific proteins that help, um, that help that virus gain entry into cells. And they were present in the ducts and asini of salivary glands. And so wow. we very rapidly decided to do two things. One, we wanted to get access to tissues from patients who were infected, and we wanted to get start a, uh, a clinical trial or a trial to compare saliva to nasopharyngeal testing. And so this was, uh, this was actually mid-March. And by late March, early April, we had initiated the trial. And basically about two weeks into this, that's when Yale and uh, the group uh, from Ann Wiley actually came up with Saliva Direct. So we didn't we were we were beat to the punch, but that's that's okay. That happens. Um, we it happens. Um, it happens when you're working on something that's exciting. Absolutely, good for you. And uh, and so we pivoted a little bit. We kept collecting data. We kept collecting NP swabs, saliva, and we were fortunate to have um, a connection to a group of pathologists that were receiving unfortunate COVID-19 autopsies. And, you know, the, the death toll in the United States is, is astronomical, but there is an opportunity to learn something, right? To understand the biology, to understand the immune consequence of SARS-CoV-2 infection. And that's just what we did in the salivary glands. So we collected those glands from the autopsies and we did a number of, uh, of, uh, of studies on them so that we could uh, better refine what the, what the involvement of the oral cavity right? Something that every dentist is really in, uh, interested in, yep. in SARS-CoV-2. And so we did, we established that saliva uh, ha contains uh, SARS-CoV-2 virus. We did some tests to show the efficacy of mask wearing, right? Just regular procedure wow. wearing to prevent the expulsion of salivary droplets. Very logical data, but no one had done this yet. And we did this all through basically a car testing, car line testing facility. So I'm doing dentistry in the car window. So you know, of all the exciting things we were doing, I'm like reaching into car windows of- Did um, you have like a suit on, like a whole hazmat suit and the whole thing? We did not. You know, there weren't enough of the of those suits to go around. Wow. So we were doing uh, an a N95 mm -hmm. and a face shield. And because I wasn't, you know, they're spitting into a cup in a car, there wasn't a lot of aerosol. I, I you know, and I, and I can attest to this. I never had, I never got- uh, COVID. Um, I tested myself in my lab for the antibodies. I was negative right up until I got the vaccine, which was, uh, I got my first dose about 28 days ago or 29 days ago. I got my second dose yesterday. So I'm a little that fatigued. How, but how and how exciting to see an intersection between dentistry and research and COVID-19. And I just think it's so exciting to be at something at the, at the cutting edge of something that's so unfortunately uh, a big deal in the United States right now and around the world. 
Yeah, I, I, it, it is. Uh, it was really fortunate and I was very lucky. I'm very privileged to work with a good team because a, a good team that not only was, was um, excited to do the work during the pandemic, but also willing to come in with all the unknowns. Uh, I couldn't have done it without them. You know, I, it's one thing for, for me, the PI to work long hours. It's a totally different ball game for your employees to be work, putting 12 hour shifts in, you know, entirely through the pandemic, dealing with kids at home and, you know, the whole bit, but in the end, you know, we have a, a paper submitted now and, uh, and it's available, you know, to, to read and <laughs> review. We think it, it, um, it does highlight some important facts about um, about the saliva glands and about the oral cavity's role in COVID-19. Um, but I think that dentists overall can use this information to protect themselves. They can use this information to uh, protect their employees and to sort of understand, you know, how it is we do our jobs safely. And I think in general, if you look at the population of dentists, we've done a pretty good job of not having a lot of uh, outbreaks uh, in the dental office, you know, um, which it's, I think it's absolutely true. Yeah. yeah. Which I think is a testament to uh, PPE, right? Uh, having access to good PPE, uh, PPE works. Um, and I think it also is a testament to, um, you know, this, uh, this um, hygiene aspect and like dentists actually do not that it's any surprise to us, but dentists do a good job. Cause I think for the rest of the medical community, it's a big unknown. You know, I think you go in, you use these instruments that make aerosols and I, and my face gets splashed, but to understand that, you know, that's very different. And we do use high speed suction and all of these things to try to protect you. And I think it kind of puts our profession in, in the, in the spotlight a little bit, but in the same regard, we did a really good job of saying, Hey, you know, you're, we are trying to keep you safe. No doubt. And, and our profession's dedication to the universal protocols was very helpful here because all we really did was add airborne pathogens to what we were already doing about bloodborne, bloodborne pathogens. And that really is, the process is virtually the same. Some of the equipment may be different. And I agree with you 100%. Dentistry has really been a superstar among some of the healthcare professions and some of the, some of the segments. So that's great. Um, question, how many doctors or how many dentists are doing research on a semi full time basis at NIH with you? I mean, are there 10? Are there 100? Oh, there, you know, there, I would say there's probably on the order of 10 to 12. Wow. Um, the people who are kind of like me, where they are a dentist scientist mm -hmm. that leads a clinical program and a research program, uh, there's probably, probably eight. Wow. Okay. And then there's another, we have fellows that train in our program, kind of like me, I advanced from the fellowship and we have another. 10 fellows ish that also do varying amounts of clinical and basic science research. Um, I knew early on when I got there that I wanted to do both like 50, 50, but that ratio changes for, for, uh, each individual, um, fellow. So, um, so if you were speaking to a young dentist, maybe a young dental student these days, what would you say to them about how, why they might consider a career or spending some of their career in dental research? Sure. I mean, I think there are basically three reasons that I think dental research is, is, um, is critical. The first is um, in order to maintain the relevance uh, of our profession uh, as, as such, as a profession, is the generation of new knowledge, right? And new knowledge includes, you know, synthesizing other published works in a digestible format. And that's kind of like what you do in dental school. Um, you read papers, you try to understand them, but then the next level up is, 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 uh, is, you know, uh, basic science, right? Trying to understand some phenomenon, uh, that's related to oral health. Um, and you know, if that level kind of excites you a little bit, I always tell people, I'm like, you know, that's when you consider maybe spending a summer doing research or spending a year out of dental school and doing research. There are, um, programs that uh, will pay you to do research, even at NIH, uh, to take a year off from dental school or medical school for that matter, and uh, come and hang out in the lab and learn some new techniques. And I think it's for those students that do that kind of, uh, that level of uh, research that if they get the bug, and that is, you know, I'm excited about my negative results as much as I am about my positive results. And I could possibly see myself working in like an academic institution or maybe even a company that does dental research, you know, you, uh, there's a couple out there, you know, Procter and Gamble, I guess comes to mind. Um, 
that there are opportunities for you to basically be a lifelong learner. You know, it's what it's you can learn always through CE, but generating the data and being able to commute, go out there and communicate your findings with other with other dentists. Um, I think there's a it takes a little bit of a spark. I say this a lot, but um, you know, it's it's like a light bulb going off in your head, and then something happens, and you're like, you know what, I'm I'm going to devote my my career to this. Uh, I would say that um, it comes with a different set. Uh, your life is a, is a lot different in a way. Um, you know, I think private practice has different types of stressors than research. You know, I think you you don't have as much of the you know worrying about the business and worrying about the staff and you know and where you know how, where's the next group of new patients going to come from. Uh, but you do worry about other things like where's the funding coming from? Are we, you know, are we, get, is the government going to shut down again? Um, you know, how do I plan for two years from now? Like, because the hiring process takes a while, um, you know, it, are my experiments going to come out? You know, am I going to have a good result? And, uh, and I, I would say if you, uh, you have to be strong, you have to be committed uh, because it's, it's mostly going to be uh, not positive results. You know, you're not going to be uh, having, you know, if, if everything goes right all the time, there's something not going right. <laughs> That's a very good point. You need you know, negative results as well as positive results. You need them both, right? You need like the, you need some experiments to fail to remind yourself that, you know, everyone makes mistakes, but you need to take good notes and you need to know where, know where your, uh, where your mistakes happen because so you don't have to make it the next time. Well, Dr. Warner, th Blake, thank you very much for spending some time with us today. I found it truly inspirational. On behalf of the rest of the dental profession, thank you very much for spending your career doing dental research at NIH. I don't think it, I, I will tell you, I don't think that what you do gets nearly enough publicity or play. Uh, what you do is hugely important and we very much appreciate it. So thank you very much. Oh, thank you, Chuck. Thank you for that, um, that warm uh, uh, sign of appreciation. I do appreciate it. I have a blast. Thank you all the taxpayers out there. <laughs> you know, I do use your money um, diligently and I do try to create new knowledge. Um, I know it's hard to, uh, you know, kind of understand uh, some of the data or maybe how it all works, but I promise you that, uh, and I'm committed to the public in that way that I will use your money well and I will change people's lives. I mean, that's my, that's my, that's my interest. So. Thank you for doing that. You, and nice, nice to meet you today. Bye-bye. Nice to meet you. Have a Thank great you. day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.